Good morning and a happy new year. I hope you have been able to, in whatever manner or shape your celebrations finally took, that you've been able to meet up with those you were legally allowed to meet up with and you've been able to celebrate Christmas together. We look into the beginning of a, a new year, a new beginning, but still very, very great uncertainty. And one of the themes of what we're going to be looking at, we're going to return to the book of the Revelation. And we're going to be asking ourselves, who is safe? Because that's the question in the air anyway, and it's very much the question that we come to as we'll turn to the book of Revelation just a little bit later. Of course, we're still having some practical arrangements to keep us safe from COVID-19. Some of the windows are open, the seating is scattered, you're required to keep a mask on during the service. In the same way, we are uh, not providing bread for communion. If you're saved and you're joining with us and you want to break bread, we're afraid you have to bring your own bread and we will supply the cup later in the service. And then afterwards, we're going to ask you to leave through the side door here, or if you're in the overflow, whatever door is nearest to you. There'll be a little basket there if you want to make an offering to support the work instead of putting a basket around. Just those are the measures that we have that are necessary for our safety. Let me just mention a couple of things. As we usually do, we collect kind of those extra gifts, the extra boxes of chocolates and so on, and they get sent out to Romania where they're very, very much appreciated by the workers with CEF out there. So if you do have anything of that, just bring it in, leave it perhaps on the table and mark it out there. Or if you want to get it directly to Rita, who's going to be taking that collection, that will get sent out to Romania and be a great encouragement to the workers there. This coming week on Tuesday evening, we're going to be setting aside an hour to pray, to pray on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. And as usual, we're doing it over WhatsApp. And we're going to be having a missionary focus. It usually would have been last week, but of course that was the holidays. So we're going to have a focus on missionary needs this coming Tuesday at our prayer meeting. And just to give you a little heads up, usually our AGM, our church AGM, would be in February. But that would put the whole run-up to that in the middle of just the current heightened restrictions. So we've decided to push it back a month. So this year our AGM is going to be towards the end of March. We're aiming for the 23rd at the minute, but like so many plans, that's going to be contingent. But we'll let you know how that goes. But we come before a God who is the only one who makes us safe. In a world that seems uncertain and where everything is a danger, is a threat, God and Christ and his salvation is our safety. So we come before him this morning. We're going to have a, a piece of music. Unfortunately, I'm going to ask those in the buildings not to sing, but do just listen to the words and worship in your hearts. And if you're at home and we want to welcome those who are joining us on the live stream, I'd encourage you very, very much, wherever you are, to sing, to sing the worship, because we're going to sing, Behold Our God.
of sinful men. God eats all, humble to the grave. Jesus, Savior, risen now to reign. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let If you ever drive a car, an automatic, when you're used to a manual car, and you spend all your time trying to remember not to press the clutch because it's not a clutch, and you're going to send your passenger through the front window. That's the way I feel about this singing. I have to keep reminding myself not to sing. But to see our God, we will one day see Him, but today He hears us, so we're going to come before Him and pray as we start. Father, we thank You for the vision that You give of yourself in Jesus Christ, that he became a man like us. He was made in every way like us. He was tempted with every way, just as we are tempted, yet he was without sin. Father, we thank you for the vision of Christ painted for us in the Gospels and all through the Scripture of what man ought to be, of perfect, sinless, second Adam. Father, we thank you that he is not simply a, a teacher, nor an illustration, nor an example we thank you that this wondrous Christ came, not simply to be seen by men, but to die for men. Father, we thank you that through faith in this Jesus Christ, we are remade. We begin to become that new man, that new creation. As your servant Paul rejoiced to say, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And Father, we thank you for as many of us as you are gathered here, whose faith is in Christ, who have been born again, that we already feel within us the beginnings of the new creation. Father, the wondrous visions of the book of Revelation, of that great and glorious city come down out of heaven, the new Jerusalem, prepared as a bride for her wedding. Father, we thank you that by your grace we already begin to feel the new creation in ourselves, in that war that it stirs in our hearts against sin and the conflict that we feel. And yet, Father, it is our blessing. We confess our sins before you, Lord, and that we have continually fallen short in that warfare that you have started. But we confess our sins before you, Father, confident that this is a war that will be won because this is a war that has already been won. As your son said when he died to bear our sins in his body, it is already finished. And so, Father, we gather in that confidence, in that assurance that one day all these sins 
will be put to death in our heart, that one day all the sin that is in the world will be taken away in your judgment, and that we will behold our God with eyes that are freed from sin. Father, such a great blessing is what gathers us, what knits us together. It's what gives us hope and confidence in this world. It's what gives us assurance that in Christ's hands we are safe. It's what allows us to intercede for those who so desperately need our prayers. We ask, Lord, your blessing on our, our time together. Father, it is still restricted in some ways because of the circumstances. Father, we, we are sad that we cannot sing as freely as we would because wherever Christ is, there is singing that is shown to us in the revelation. But Lord, we thank you for the, that music in our hearts, for the song, singing offered by those who are at home. And we ask, Lord, for your blessing on our country that there will be again a time when we can worship shoulder to shoulder in full freedom, giving voice to that hope that is ours through Jesus Christ. So Lord, bless us in all that is done in this time in the prayer and the speaking of your word and in the remembrance of Christ's death at the table. Bless us in these things, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have a, a few minutes for the children. Lauren has recorded a message for them, so whether you're at home or whether you're here, this is for you guys. Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Welcome to 2021. Um, it's fantastic to be here. And uh, I'm here this morning to tell you a wee bit about what it's like to be a teacher. Um, as most, I think most of you know, I'm an English teacher in Wellington. And I want to ask you, what do you think is one of the best ways that I know as a teacher that the students in my class are listening and learning? What do you think? You might have said it's when the students give you the correct answer. So when I ask a question and somebody puts up their hand and tells me the right answer, or when they write the right answer in a test and I'm able to go tick, 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 maybe that's the best way to know. But you know, for me, it's not. Sometimes that kid who's always putting up their hand and giving me the right answer, they might be taking time away from someone who doesn't know. Or maybe if they wrote down the right answer in a test, maybe they learned that from their mom or maybe from TV, or maybe from another teacher, and they're not actually showing me that they've listened and learned in my class. The best way, in my opinion, that students can show their listening and learning is when they ask questions. Because it shows that they've heard what I've said, they're processing it, and they wanna ask and learn more themselves. Now, I'm not talking about the question, miss, can I please go to the toilet? That's the worst question. But questions where they've actually thought about what I've said are always really good. And that shows me that they're listening and learning. But you know, sometimes in church, maybe we can be a wee bit afraid about asking questions and showing that we don't fully understand something. Maybe we worry that Gordon might think we're a wee bit silly, or Tim might think we haven't been listening properly, or that other people in church might go, tut, tut, you should know that. You know, God never says those things about questions, and I'm sure Gordon and Tim and the rest of the church don't either. God never says that's a stupid question, or you shouldn't be asking me that. In fact, in the Bible, so many of the big names in the Bible asked God questions when he came and told them to do things. One of those people is Moses. Um, God came to Moses and asked him to free his people from um, the, the reign of Pharaoh in Egypt. And Moses asked God five questions, showing his doubts and his fears about what God was asking him to do. The conversation lasts uh, just about two full pages in my Bible. It's in chapters three and four in the book of Exodus. Moses asked God five questions. He asked him, who am I? Who am I that you send me? He asked God, who are you? Who are you that you're able to send me? He asks God, what if they don't believe me? He says to God, God, I can't speak. I have a stutter. Please, God, don't send me. And finally, he just says outright, Lord, please send someone else to do it. That's in Exodus chapter 4, verse 13. Moses was full of questions, full of insecurities and fears and doubts. And he expresses those fears and doubts to God. Another person who expresses questions to God is Gideon. And we learned about Gideon in CCTV. We read about his life in the book of Judges. And you know, God asked Midian to do a really scary thing. He asked Gideon to go and free the Israelites from the Midianites who were oppressing them. And Gideon, 
uh, just as Moses was, was really afraid. Gideon again asked God questions. He says, um, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? Now the Lord has abandoned us. He really questions God here. And he says again, Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest and I am the least in my family. He questions who God is and he questions who he is, who Gideon is, just as Moses did. These men were afraid and they weren't afraid to question God and to ask him. And one more person who we've learned a lot about coming up to Christmas is Mary. And you probably know that an angel of the Lord appeared to Mary to tell her that she would bear a son and that he would be called Emmanuel. And when the angel first appeared to Mary, um, this is what we read in Luke chapter 1 verse 29. It says, Mary was greatly troubled at the angel's words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. And you know, that word wondered in the Greek is actually a wee bit closer to Mary added it up or Mary tried to figure it out. It doesn't just mean she sort of sits back and goes, hmm, wonder what that means. It means she really thinks deeply about it. She again questions, she worries, she fears, and she expresses those questions to an angel in this case. And of course the angel was a representative of God. You see in the Bible, God doesn't tell us that we're not to question him. He doesn't say that we're just to blindly follow and, um, and to sort of swallow our fears and to not express them. God in fact tells us in James chapter one, verse five to six, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. So God tells us if you lack wisdom, if you doubt, if you fear, if you don't have understanding, come and ask me just like a father would to a son. That's the way God treats us. He wants us to express our doubts and fears and questions to him. And this is the important part then. The rest of that verse reads, but when he asks, he must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. When we ask and God answers, we must believe. And you'll know that that was the case for Moses, Gideon and Mary. Of course, Moses went on and rescued God's people from Pharaoh. Gideon went on and rescued God's people from the Midianites. And Mary, of course, as we just learned about, went on and bore Jesus. But you know, God didn't leave those people on their own to do those things. God gave Moses Aaron. And Aaron was able to speak for Moses because Moses had this stutter. God gave Gideon two signs. You remember about the fleeces, which Gideon left out at night. God gave Gideon those signs to show him that God would be with him. And God gave Mary Joseph. And God gave Mary Elizabeth, who was her cousin, um, who also bore a son at the same time, miraculously. You see, God is gracious. He will not shout at us if we have questions. He will not be angry and tell us that we're stupid. He is gracious and he will help us. So we can trust God with our doubts. We can trust God with our questions. And ultimately we can trust God with our lives. And we can definitely do that coming into 2021, a brand new year. I hope you all have a wonderful year. Um, I pray God's richest blessings on you all. And if you have questions, don't be afraid to ask. Maybe just don't ask me. Ask Gordon or Tim. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone, and see you soon. Thanks, Lauren, for doing that, but not for dumping me in it. But it is so important, actually, and it's not just for the children. I mean, our church should be the place where we bring our questions, where we expose our doubts. All too often, we treat church as if it's the place where we pretend we have all the answers, when it's supposed to be the place that we come with all our fears, because our faith is that he will hold us no matter what our fears and no matter what our dangers and that's the theme of the the next piece of music that we're going to have and again those in the building i'm afraid we'll just have to listen along and sing in our hearts but those at home please do sing out he will hold me fast as he holds us fast that we can not simply ask one another our questions but bring them to him and we can bring the things that make us afraid that make us concerned with a tremendous frankness. That's what the psalmist teaches us. The psalms should give us an example of how completely open
with our fears and even our frustrations, we can be with God. That's why we bring everything to God. That's why we pray. And just before we pray together for many of those needs, I want to update you in a few things so that you can continue in your own prayers. We have been praying, of course, this last week since Christmas, really, for George Haffey, very specially. George is still in hospital. He did have a, a chest infection that seems to have lifted a little, so he is somewhat improved, but he's still very ill, still very restless, and uh, the family are with him virtually 24 hours a day. So please do pray for him, for God to be with them in that place, and also for the family, for Sheila and for David and for John and Joy in particular as they're being with him in the ward. Sally also came through her surgery on Friday. She got that, went through successfully. She is now not going to be able to put her foot in the ground for six weeks, which is going to be quite challenging. So do just continue to pray for her, give thanks that she's got that surgery and is through it. And for all those things, we, we come before God now. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that as many as put their faith in Christ are held immovably by Christ. And yet, Father, so many of this world's troubles still break over us. So much fear still surrounds us. So much uncertainty still invades our hearts. And so, Lord, we thank you that you have thrown open the, the throne of grace, that we can come before you in this way, but also individually, each one of us, any place and any time where we may be. And we can lay before you the things that weigh on our hearts, the things that fill us with fear for the future. So, Lord, in the name of Christ, we come before you and, and ask for your mercy for George. We thank you for bringing him through these last few days. We thank you, Lord, for the somewhat improvement that he has seen. We thank you for the care that, that is received there. We thank you for the freedom that the family has to visit. Once so very often, the wards are, are completely locked down. But we do ask for your help for him. You see his condition. You see the state of the situation. And we ask that you would bring peace to that room. We thank you for his faith, for our confidence that his life is held immovably in the hands of Christ. Father, we pray for Sheila as she sits by his bedside and as she gets the rest that she can. We pray for David and for Joy and for John who helped there. And we, we pray also for the wider family as they look on and as they pray. And Father, we are reminded of how helpless we are in this world, how frail we are in our flesh. But Lord, to be certain, that our lives are hid with Christ, with God, and that no matter what the circumstance, this is our very great confidence in, in these times. But Lord, do hear, do act, and let us see your hand, we pray. Father, we pray for Sally. We give you thanks, Lord, that you brought her through surgery, and we continue to pray for her and for Mark with the, the, all the complications that are going to follow from the necessity of her recuperation. We pray, Lord, for healing and the wound and in the injury itself. It's a a complex break, Lord, we ask that you would give her that, that full movement again. We continue to pray, Father, for Jim and for Diane in the awful circumstances they are found, and particularly in this, as this isolation only compounds the difficulties that Jim faces as he cares for Diane. We pray that you would give her peace in her mind and in her heart, and that she may be at rest despite the circumstances. We pray, Father, for Robert and for Audrey that you would continue to, to sustain them in the separation that they are enduring. Father, we pray for all of our families and all the members and associates associated with our church. For all of us, Lord, we stand in this world so exposed at every hour and every day to emergency and to crisis, and so many of which cannot even be shared. Father, we lay before you silently those needs, unnamed those crises that are represented even here. And we ask for your mercy. We ask for your wisdom. We ask for that strength, for our strength is not enough. Our wisdom is insufficient. Lord, it is your righteousness. It is your grace alone that can help us and sustain us. Father, we pray for our work and testimony as a church and as individual Christians, that we may be faithful to that calling which is ours, not simply to enjoy your grace, but to become sharers of that grace. Father, we ask that you would give us courage to speak, opportunity to share that you would give us conviction of the power of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we will speak as those who truly believe it is the power of God unto salvation for every single person we meet and for every person in our families, for those who, into whose lives you place us. Father, we're so keenly aware that it is only in those very limited circles now 
for so much of, of, of public ministry and of public outreach is, is restricted. Father, we pray that what we take from this place today, we will carry with us, that we will become the speakers of the message of eternal life and that you will bless by saving men and women and children. Father, we pray for all those who are engaged in this work in Carry Duff with all the churches who meet under various circumstances. We pray for the churches throughout Ireland, both those of our, our own association and of every kind where the gospel is preached. Father, we pray for those who work across the world for, world for missionaries across Europe and America and every continent, every place, places of darkness where the, the gospel is hated and oppressed and places of freedom and prosperity where the gospel is deemed unnecessary. Father, we ask that your church will be faithful. We will be given power to speak with conviction, but more importantly, with the fullness of the Holy Spirit to point and to raise the dead through these living words. Father, we ask that you would use us in whatever way that we may be faithful, we may follow Christ, and we may bring glory to his name. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to turn to the Scriptures now. And if you have a Bible with you, can I ask you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 14. If you're at home, please do get a Bible. If you need to get up and go and get it, feel free to do that. It is, it's best to follow along. That's a few weeks since we were looking at Revelation. We looked at it just before Christmas. And, and what we found there in, in chapters 12 and 13 was a very peculiar nativity story. Because although chapter 11, when you get that far, it seems to describe the very end of this age, chapter 12 seems to wind the clock back to that night when all the promises of the Old Testament were met in the birth of Jesus Christ. In chapter 12, he goes back and he, he seems to be telling us the same story from another perspective because if chapter 6 and to 11 describe God's war for the world, that movement down from heaven to earth, and then from chapter on, we begin to see Satan's war for the soul of the church. This is what God is doing in those earlier chapters. Now, this is what Satan, our enemy, does in response. And chapter 12 tells us that when the Messiah was born, Satan was thrown down out of heaven. But even though he is, is greatly reduced, he is far from harmless. Chapter 13 shows us that that fallen dragon, that ancient serpent, the devil, he summons two terrible beasts to do his work, to act as, as proxies for him. The first which he makes in his own image seems to represent all political and military power. It's, it's a composite image of all the great empires of the world. Lord Acton said that all power tends to corrupt. And how often has the church been corrupted by the temptation of power? That's the first beast and how the, the devil manipulates and moves. But he has a second beast. He was called later on in the Revelation a false prophet. He makes an image for the world to worship. And in chapter 13 and verse 11, it says he looks like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. He represents all the perversions of Christianity, all the, the easier Jesuses to follow, all, all the nicer doctrines that, that fit in more comfortably. This is what the, the devil does. He, he seeks to reduce Christianity to a little more than a, a lifestyle choice, a, a set of rules to be followed. These are the forces that are arrayed against us. A dragon bound but bitter. A beast promising power and glory to everyone who will fall into its train. And the false prophet looking for all the world like a lamb, but speaking like the dragon. And the question we're left asking ourselves is who could stand against that? Who is safe? Let's read Revelation chapter 14. Then I looked, and there before me was the lamb, standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. 
Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed, from, followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image, or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung its sickle on the earth and gathered its grapes and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. And they were trampled in the winepress outside the city and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Those are God's words. Who is safe? Who's safe? That's, that's the question. It's the question that hangs in the air in our country. Who is safe? Do, do masks make you safe? Will the vaccine make us safe? But there's a much more profound question hanging in the air at the end of chapter 13. Who is safe against such enemies? With the dragon cast down and, and, and trying desperately through every political agency and military power, to use our own lust to be in charge against us, to tempt us, to corrupt us, without using false religion to trap us at those points where it does seem so very hard sometimes to follow Jesus, who, who gives us an alternate path, something that looks like the lamb, even though it sounds like the dragon. Who's safe against that? How can you, how can you protect yourself against this? Who, who's safe from getting sucked into political debates and, and allying the church with some political side because we think that will help us to get the gospel out. Who's safe from having their faith corrupted from, from something that's a sacrificial devotion to the Savior who loved me and gave himself for me into just that regular weekly habit of showing up in a church where I know the people and the sermons make me feel comfortable? How do you be safe against that? I mean, Satan is so subtle. When his influence seems to be everywhere, who is safe? The answer John gives is chapter 14. Because after he has shown the beast, after he sees the false prophet, what he sees here is the lamb. Then I looked, and before me was the lamb. And around him are a people who are safe. Because in chapter 13 and verse 16, we, we had another crowd. We had a multitude of people, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, who had received a mark, the mark of the beast, on their right head and on their forehead, and said over against them here in chapter 14 
are these 144,000 who instead of the mark of the beast have the name of the lamb on their forehead. And just as the, the lamb seems to stand in opposition to the beast and to the false prophet, this crowd of 144,000, they stand apart from all those marked, owned by the beast. Because the essential thing to remember, I think, is, is it's not that they have refused the mark of the beast. That they are, they are not safe because they said no. I think the proper way to look at this is that the name of the lamb protected them from the beast. The reason the beast wasn't able to put his mark on their head, control their thoughts, get inside their hearts, is because the name of Christ was already on them. If you have the name of Christ on your head, the beast cannot mark you for his own. Because you remember that this is, the, this is how it's painted for us. Back in chapter 7 and verse 3, where we first were introduced to this body of 144,000 people, the angel said, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. They, they are sealed by God for Christ, and that's what keeps them safe. Because that's what it means to be redeemed from the earth, as he, as he puts it in verse 3 here. It means Christ has, has named them. When you come to Christ, you're not just getting a bunch of rules and a way to live. He marks you spiritually. He says, this one is mine. I'm not ashamed to say it to the whole of creation. I put my name on him so that everybody will know that despite his flaws, despite the way he keeps letting me down, he's mine. No one else can have him. That, that's why he's safe. That's the only thing that can make us safe from these terrifying forces that are arrayed against us in chapter 13. That means the answer to the question, who is safe when the bitterness of the defeated devil unleashes the beast and a sea of false images of Christ against us, the answer is to what 144,000 are. And as I suggested back in, in chapter 7 when we, when we met these, it's my belief that this 144,000 represents the church. It's not a, a literal number of individuals, as, as Jehovah's Witness, for example, would say. This is a perfect number. It is 12. It is 12 twelves. It is 12 twelves multiplied a thousandfold. The whole body of those for whom Christ died. And who is safe? They are safe. And as I, as I think about that, it seems to me there are three things that mark out these people who are safe. How you can be sure that these are the people who are safe. Firstly, they are those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. That's their distinguishing mark that makes them different from those who have been claimed by the beast. Secondly, they are those who long for the day of judgment. Which is strange and unexpected, but they long for the day of judgment. And the third thing that seems to mark them out is that they are those who patiently endure. And those three things, those things that mark out these people who are safe in this world, that they follow the Lamb wherever He goes, that they long for the day of judgment, and that they patiently endure for now, that's what I want to think about this morning. So let's think about that, that first attribute of those whom Christ has redeemed from the earth, the thing that marks them out as those who are safe. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. That's what John says in verse 4 here. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And he uses this vivid image that they are, they are virgins. And that's not to be taken literally. I mean, Paul says quite explicitly that if you marry, you do not sin. There's nothing sinful. This is a purity. It's a metaphor you find in the Old Testament. Because when Israel worshipped other gods, how did the prophets describe it? He said, they've committed adultery. I bought them as my wife, and they're running off with these gods. That's the image that John has taken. They have kept themselves pure from the false religions, the, the false images that the false prophet is trying to project into the world. They are safe because they are kept from false religions. They are safe because they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And the interesting thing is that he doesn't just describe them as those who are followers of Jesus. Because that's how we, you know, we describe ourselves, you know, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. He doesn't just say they follow Jesus. He says they follow Jesus wherever he goes. 
And it's that, it's that extra element, it's that qualification. No matter where he goes, that's what makes them safe. That's how you know they really are his, and, and they're not just hangers-on who, who are traveling along with him just, just for the present. I mean, even in the days of his ministry on earth, there were always those who followed Jesus for a little while, weren't there? That there were those who, who would follow him to see the miracles. And when he stopped doing the miracles, they stopped following him. There were some people who followed him because of the bread that he could miraculously produce out of five loaves and two fish. Even Judas followed him for a while because he thought it would make him rich. But every single one of them eventually found a place that Jesus went where they didn't want to follow. Those who loved him for the bread didn't want to follow him into hunger. Judas, who followed him for the money, didn't want to follow him to the cross. There was a place where they didn't want to follow. And that's where the danger is. We need to examine ourselves. Is there a place where I don't want to follow Jesus? I'm not prepared to follow Jesus because wherever that is in my life, that is where I am not safe. That is where the beast and the false prophet have a wide open door to win my heart, to, 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 to drag me down. Because if it's a place I don't want to follow Jesus, well, maybe I'll follow a, another Jesus. You know, it turns out I had him wrong all along. Actually, Jesus doesn't mind this sin. And I, I wander off with that. That's the danger. I don't want to follow the real Jesus. So I become susceptible to follow a fake Jesus. I'm not prepared to follow Jesus into the danger. But so, I, so I'll follow with the beast promises safety. The beast has armies. The beast has navies. The beast has all the political influence we could ask for. It's safe with him. It's a place where I won't follow Jesus. That's a place where I will lose my soul. It's the thing we're, we're challenged, we're faced very directly. We are living through a change in our society from a condition that many of us are remember where to be a Christian was, was actually something that got you a bit of respectability. You know, if for some reason you were up in court, you would say, yes, but he's a Sunday school teacher or he, he's a deacon in his church and that would be a good thing. Now that's the last thing you would mention. We're living through a, a transition where that, that's been taken away. Are we prepared to follow Jesus even when that kind of political cover evaporates? Are we prepared to be Christians who believe what Jesus actually taught? Not just what I'm sure Jesus would say if he was here today, you know, that kind of flippy, floppy, vicar, a dibbly kind of Christianity, but actual biblical Christianity? We're beginning to find ourselves in a world where to say that kind of thing is more likely to be a hindrance to your career than win you any kind of respect. It's more likely to see you ostracized socially than win you any friends. Will we follow Jesus into that? As our society changes, will we stay with society or we will follow Jesus out into the wilderness? As the beast once again asserts himself in what was, well, at least nominally a vaguely Christian country, with vaguely Christian sentiments, will we be tempted to say, like the crowd say back in chapter 13 and verse 4, who's like the beast? Who can make war against them? Isn't that what we say? Well, you know it's the government. It's the law. There's not a thing we can do about it. But well, you're just going to have to go along because that's just the way things are. Isn't that what we do? You have to put up with these things because it's the only way to stay out of prison. But what if Jesus is in prison? Shouldn't I follow him there? What if it comes to the point where the only place a Christian should be is in prison? Will I follow him? In 1947, the German pastor Martin Neimuller, who by his own admission had failed to stand up against what the Nazis began, began to do in Germany in the 30s, he made a kind of confession. And he said, I ask myself again and again, what would have happened? If in the year 1933 or 1934, 14,000 Protestant pastors and all Protestant communities in Germany had defended the truth until their deaths. If we had said back to the, then that it was not right when Hermann Goring simply puts 100,000 communists in the concentration camps. I can imagine that perhaps 30,000 or 40,000 Protestant Christians would have had their heads cut off. 
But I can also imagine that we would have rescued 30 or 40 million people. In days like those, following Jesus is the only way to be safe. Not for our bodies, but for our souls. But there are even simpler temptations today, subtler temptations. Are you and I prepared to follow Jesus into the end of friendships? Into the closing of doors at work? Or will will we be tempted to, to worship the image of another Jesus? You know, most people who who change their views on sexual morality, who suddenly find out one day that it turns out the Bible doesn't actually always condemn adultery, that that, that, that homosexuality isn't actually condemned by the Bible, almost everyone who, who makes that journey, it's almost never because they spent weeks poring over the New Testament. It's almost invariably because somebody they love has come to them and said, listen, I'm gay. Or because they find themselves suddenly to be hopelessly in love with someone who's not their wife. And at that moment, I don't want to follow Jesus because it means saying no. It means looking into the eyes of someone I love and saying, this is a sin. What you're doing, what you're choosing, it is a sin. And that's the moment you hear the false prophet in your ear and he says, yes, but there is another Jesus. A Jesus who can live with this stuff. Follow him. Is that how it happens? That's how even a fallen dragon is able to corrupt the church. And the only way to be safe is to follow the lamb wherever he goes. This is another attribute of those who are safe in the day of Satan's fury. They not only follow Jesus wherever he goes, they also long for the day of judgment. And if anything, this is even more challenging. They long for the day of judgment. Look at verses 6 to 11. Verses 6 to 11 describe three announcements made by angels flying in midair. And the first in verse 6 is an angel given an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. Now, there's a couple of things that make me think this is not the gospel that we think of, the gospel of salvation. Remember, the word gospel simply means good news. The first is that in the New Testament, angels are never asked to preach the gospel. That's our job. The Great Commission is given to the church. The second is that even though the NIV says he has given the eternal gospel, strictly speaking, as as other translations have it, there's no definite article there. He says he's given an eternal gospel. And thirdly, the very next verse tells us what the gospel, the good news he had actually was. Verse 7 says, the good news is that the hour of God's judgment has come. Now, to us, that may not seem like good news. But to the 144,000, for those who were safe, the coming of the terrible reckoning that is described in this chapter was good news. That's difficult for us to say, I think. Our sensibilities are perhaps too too refined. Ironically, it seems to us almost to say, to be unchristian, to say that it is good that there is a hell. It is good that God will condemn some to hell. Even some that we know. It is good news. Because it's the only hope this world has. If there is no judgment, the world will always be like this. That's why the 144,000 receive it as good news, an eternal good. And we need to be really, really careful about this. We, We need to be really careful that we don't pretend to be more compassionate than God. Because this is the trap we fall into when we think about hell. C.S. Lewis was very frank. C.S. Lewis wrote, There is no doctrine I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this. But that is an immensely dangerous attitude. We need to be careful that we don't end up saying, in effect, you know, if we were in charge, there would be no hell because we are compassionate. But you know what God's like. I mean, we wouldn't say it like that. 
but we flirt with that kind of blasphemy when we only tolerate the doctrine of God's eternal punishment? When we only with reluctance admit, well, yes, that's what the Bible says. The only way we are safe from the comforting lies of the false prophet is when we accept, as the 144,000 accepted, that the announcement that the hour of God's judgment has come is good news. It's good that there's a hell. What else could burn the evil out of this world? What else could restore justice to a world filled with anguish and suffering and misery? There must be justice. The crisis must come. The judgment must fall if this world is ever to be made clean. I mean, as we live now, we we live as Christians with our sins forgiven, but we're still at war in our own selves. The only way this war ends is when the judgment of God comes. And in in his vision, as John is confronted with this, he's certainly not allowed to gloss over the details. I mean, just listen to the proclamation of the third angel in verse 9. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will drink of the wine of God's fury. He will be tormented with burning sulfur. The smoke of their torment rises forever. Of course, we must never take any delight in this. God himself says in Ezekiel chapter 33, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He wants the wicked to turn from their sins. That's why Christ has gone to such extraordinary measures to save us, to plead with us, to turn from our sins. But if we don't, make no mistake, it is good that there will be judgment for those sins. It's good because God does it, and God does no evil. It's good that the smoke of their torment rises. If you're not a Christian, you have to look at this truth square in the eye. Because what's wrong with this world is not the politicians, it's not the terrorists, it's you and I. We are what is wrong with this world, and this world cannot be saved until we are dealt with one way or the other. This world will never be free of of tears and tragedy until judgment comes. This fire, this fury is the only hope. The unimaginably good news is that in Jesus Christ, God opens a door for us to survive it. I mean, I walked through that door 30 years ago, and I still stand amazed that Jesus Christ would step into that for me. That knowing that that is what is needed, that is what is right, he put his body in the way of mine. That's what it means. That's what the cross means. This is why we we will not value the cross until we say this is good and necessary. Because those who discard the doctrine of hell will very soon discard the doctrine of the cross. But when you can look at yourself and say, yes, it would be right for me to be condemned to hell, The only just thing that's possible is that the smoke of my torment would go up and then be told that Jesus will endure it for you? He'll go to hell for you? That is the glory of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This truth is is what makes us one. Our unity in the church is not based that we all have the same tastes or we all come from the same social class or background. It's our understanding that we're all condemned by the same judgment. We come to that judgment a thousand different ways. You know, you sin differently than I do. I don't understand why you sin that way. I would never do what you do. I don't understand why, why she does this and he does that. We come to condemnation a thousand different ways, but we come to the same condemnation. That's what makes us one. Because no matter how we got to this place, we deserve the same judgment and we depend on the same Savior. That's our our unity here. It's always tempting to despise the other person's sin. But we need to stop trying to find unity in the people who happen to like the same sins we do and look for it in those who have the same Savior that we do. You don't need to understand why he is so tempted by something that has no power on you 
we need to understand that all of us, the only good thing for God to do would be to damn the lot of us. But in Christ, we share a common salvation. And it's only a longing for that final judgment to come, to remake, to end the war. That's the only thing that keeps us safe from lies of false Christs and diminished atonements and easy relationships with the world. I've asked who's safe. It's safe to say the answer is not easy. Because those who are safe are those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes, even to the grave. Those who are safe are those who long for the day of judgment, no matter how terrible it may be. That's why as I finish the third attribute of those who are safe in this world, those who are safe from the devil's puppets are those who patiently endure. Look at verse 12. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. It's those who patiently endure, who patiently avoid the temptation to have shortcuts to joy in this life. They are safe. Because see, it's the impatient. It's the impatient who are tempted to do deals with the government. We compromise on that point. We have access to huge markets. We will have immense influence because we are impatient. We will not wait for God. It's those who refuse to endure, to endure the, the shame or the scorn of actually saying out loud, I believe what Jesus said. It's those who are unwilling to endure, who are prepared to, to trade true doctrines for public acceptability who will be tempted to follow something that looks enough like a lamb to make them feel faithful, but sounds enough like the dragon to make them feel acceptable. It's not easy. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints. We need to settle in our minds that we're not going to be popular. It doesn't matter how we frame the gospel. By all means, we, we're not trying to be offensive for the sake of being offensive, but we're not going to be popular. If you stand as a Christian, you're not likely to rise to the top of your field, no matter how good you are. Get used to the idea. It calls for patient endurance. And what we need to realize is that that's actually not so bad, not compared to the alternative. Because it may feel safe to be embraced by society. It may feel safe to cling to a version of Christianity that doesn't offend quite so many people, but there is no safety in it. Not really. Because the only real safety is the safety of those who are in Christ. A man who locks his door may still get robbed in the street. A man who recovers from cancer may still die in a car crash. And a man who compromises his faith to keep his job is probably going to get fired in the next round of cuts anyway. There is no safety in dealing with the beast, with the false prophet, and with the lies. The only safety is in following Christ, no matter where he goes. It calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints. And that's why he goes on to say, blessed are those of the dead who die in the Lord, in verse 13. He's not saying that we're better off if we were dead. He's not saying death is some kind of gateway. What he's saying is if you die and you're still in the Lord, if you die in the Lord, not in the clutches of the promises of the beast, not, not drawn away by the easier life promised by a false prophet. If you die and you're still in the Lord, that is a blessing. Because what Jesus does, he transforms death into the end of a race won. The death of the saints who die in the Lord are those who die having finished the commission given to them, done the task assigned to them. For them, their death is a seal that they were faithful. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord because they weren't tempted to walk away from the Lord, to be more powerful, to be more popular. Because at the graveside, it won't really matter if you were saved from anything else. His death for our sins makes our death meaningful. Without Christ, death is nothing but the last gasp of a field rebel. A man who lived his life as if he was God, only to have himself proved to be mortal by the first shovel of dirt on his coffin. Death unites those who die without Christ in futility. Because no matter what their, prom their dreams were, they die with them. It unites those who die in Christ in the knowledge that our deeds, no matter how flawed and how imperfect they were, they follow us to heaven. 
That's what gives us confidence. Because the things you do are imperfect. The things I do are imperfect. Even those conversations where you tried to speak for Jesus and it went terribly, terribly wrong. It was a complete train wreck. I was shown to be a complete hypocrite. Or the guy was so much smarter than me, he just made me look like a complete idiot and, a, and nothing but a, a bigot. Even those, those works follow us to heaven. Because Jesus can use even that. I suspect when we find, when those works follow us to heaven, God will have done much more with them than we thought. I'm tempted not to say anything because I'll just go wrong the last time. You don't know what happened the last time. You don't know whether the, the, the Christian who's been sitting in the office, who's terrified to say anything and heard you go down in flames for Jesus, was not emboldened. Uh, he might try it himself the next time. You have no idea whether even the person who completely destroyed you for daring to say you were a Christian, you don't know if your word's stuck in his head for years. When we take the courage and we stay close to Jesus wherever he goes, we speak for him wherever we find ourselves, his works follow us. Jesus doesn't ask us to follow him with eloquence or with power. He doesn't ask us to follow him with flawless endeavors. He just asks us to follow him wherever he goes. And when we do that, when we patiently endure, when we go wherever he leads, wherever he goes, and we in our hearts truly long for the day of judgment, when we teach and learn to patiently endure, then we will be safe. And we're going to sing of that place of safety. And those in the building, I'm going to encourage you to sing. Do remain seated and keep your masks on, please. But we're going to sing beneath the cross of Jesus. Because if we follow Jesus, even to the cross, then we will be safe. great the joy before us to be his perfect bride and it's it's that reality of what we become when we are born again that we remember at the lord's table the lord's table is when we come and we feast with him we celebrate that we are united to him we we remember this week by week in anticipation of that great feast when that bride will be presented we will be presented flawless 
because as Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 17, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It is good that the judgment of God comes. It is right that sin should be punished. But it is not the love of God. The love of God is that you and I be saved. He didn't send Christ to judge the world, although Christ will return to judge the world. He sent Christ so that you and I who put our faith in him might be saved. And the token of that salvation is not simply a get-out-of-jail-free card for the last day. It's an invitation every day to dine with him, to have fellowship with him, to sit at table with him, so to speak, as friends do. That's what we've missed over Christmas, to sit down with friends, because that is how we we express our love. That's how we celebrate the ties that knit us together. And every week when we come to the table, we rejoice in the truth that because of his death for our sins, Jesus accepts us at his table. So before we eat bread and share the cup, can I ask if someone will give thanks for that? Give thanks for our place here at this table in this time and in this place.